good morning, everyone. Let's all stand, if we would, please. You can't sing Christ arose sitting down, so we have to stand. Sing it out with us now. Oh, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph o'er his fold, he arose. still in the grave. Oh, no, he arose. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. All righty, well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Brother Joseph, would you lead us in prayer, please? Lord, thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that you've given us. Yes. We thank you for this church, Lord, <clears throat> that you know the, the ones that need to be saved, you know what's going on. <clears throat> yes. And we just pray for this church and lead them. The ones that may be listening online, Lord, all the visitors that have come today, we would just ask that if they don't know what you would want them to do, Lord, that they would just come and see accept you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've been a God to this yes. church, this church. We thank you for all that you've done and not only on the cross, but also in the grave. Yes. We thank you for all the ones here, Lord. We pray that you would just let us speak to you, sing to you, everything that goes yes. on, Lord. We pray that it's a blessing and a joy to all who hear this word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let's remain standing. We'll sing one verse here. Of course, it is one verse of uh, I will sing of the mercies and then we'll go around and shake hands let everybody know that you're glad they're here amen sing it out now I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever I will sing I will sing
glad that you're here today. A lot of people got Texas allergies. So if this is the first time that you're going through a fall in Texas, get ready. It's going to get worse, okay? <laughs> it's going to get worse. But uh, a lot of people out because of that and a lot of people out because of traveling. So uh, pray for one another as they travel and then pray for those that are not here today just that God will get them better and they come back uh, to worship with us. It's good to have visitors here. I uh, hope everybody got a bu uh, bulletin this morning. Inside the flyleaf of our bulletin, there is a visitor's card. We greatly appreciate it if you would fill it out, put it in the offering plate, put it on the seat, or give it to me after the service. It'll be a record of your visit. We ask for God's richest blessing on you today, and just hope that you have a want everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving. As far as services are concerned, come out tonight, 6 o'clock, for evening service, and then uh, Wednesday night, at 7 o'clock for a midweek service. Uh, we had a great prayer meeting Thursday night, and uh, we see God answer prayers all the time. So uh, come out Wednesday night. We are going through the book of John. We are just starting John chapter 15 this Wednesday night. So come out and do that. Have a good Thanksgiving. And once again, if you're traveling, and I'll turn this on, um, if you're traveling, have a safe journey. The only other thing for November is the next ladies bible study will not be this tuesday night it'll be on the 28th on the 28th and a rise and go is the is the theme of it and led by my wife come out in fellowship hall at 6 30 and it'll be a good time of fellowship and learning about god's word and then next week we will have all the stuff for december even start talking about what we'll do for christmas and new year's services so uh, once again it's good to have you all here today and just stay safe. Uh, you can see that they're rooting up all the trees. And all the stuff out here is going to turn into a mess. But that's okay. We're going to keep on having church, okay? And uh, actually, they put up a sign. It said church out there on both ways to get ready for it. So that's a wonderful thing. Uh, it hadn't existed before. Now we have a church sign. So let's all stand as we sing one more song before our offering. I will sing of my Redeemer. Usher's the last verse for our offering. Amen. Let's sing it out now. Sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer with His blood He purchased me. Big go. 
in you. Lord, we just ask be with everything that's done today, Lord, especially the offering. Lord, we ask that you bless the gift giver, those unable to give. May it go to further your kingdom. Father, help us, Lord, be faithful stewards of what you've given to us, Lord. But we love you and we thank you, and we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Give. See you. While my pianist is setting up, y'all pray for me. This is a new song. Um, I heard it, and I was very wild. Um, but yeah. Three Hebrew children face their greatest trial of all. The king said, give them one last chance. Surely their faith will fall. But they would not bow and they would not bend. And what they said was, we will stand. For the God we serve is able to deliver from your hand. But if not, we're still gone. We're still gonna bless his name through the darkest night. Not our will, but thy be done, oh Lord, you know our heart. He may grant us our request, but if not, we'll trust your way. Lord, I know that I have prayed this prayer so many times before, but here I am before you now, pleading my case once more. Lord, you know how important this one thing is to me, and I believe you're able to give me what I need. But if not, I'm still gonna love with all my mind. I'm still gonna bless your name through the darkest night. Not my will, but thy be done. Oh Lord, you know my heart. Grant me my request, but if not, I'll trust your way is best. Though the raging sea inside of me, sometimes it's hard to stand, but you've always calmed my troubled heart and held me in your hand. But if not, I'm still gonna love with all my mind. I'm still gonna bless your name through the darkest night. Not my will, but thy be done. Oh Lord, you know my heart. You may grant me my But if not, I'll trust your way is best. 
For those watching on the internet, we're having the typical problems right now. They're upgrading the internet around here and they're taking down the internet periodically and that's why we're having drops out this morning. But we are taping it, we will upload it, the entire service later on today, but we are streaming right now. Good morning, kids. Okay, I know there's kids out there, I know there's people that wanna be kids, but uh, this is Thanksgiving week and you're probably happy that we don't have school this week. I'm happy that we don't have school this week. And other people that have kids in school, maybe, maybe about Wednesday, eh, I go back to school. But this morning I wanna talk real quickly about a man who had a large impact, probably the largest impact on our faith, besides Jesus Christ, and that's the Apostle Paul. This is a picture of what someone might think that Paul looks like. We don't have pictures of him, because he lived in the first century AD. But we do know this. We do know that he wrote a lot of letters. We do know that he went a lot of places. We do know that he was in prison a lot. We do know that he went through a lot of trials for Jesus. And the issue is, is that when we know Jesus, the troubles don't necessarily stop, but we have the ability to get through them. We have peace, and we talked about that last week. We have power because we're plugged into Jesus instead of being plugged into something else. And so Paul is responsible for writing most of the New Testament, and that's how we know how we need to follow Christ because God told Paul what to write. But the thing that we need to be most thankful for is how God has changed us. And that's the most significant thing about Paul. Before Paul met Jesus, he was assisting in killing Christians, putting them into prison. He was probably the biggest enemy of the church. And God met him on the road to Damascus. And Christ talked to him directly. And he got saved. And it changed his life. And then he becomes the greatest preacher of the gospel in the church age. God can take the worst of you and take all that away and make you new and make you the best that you could possibly be for him. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes this. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Several things we need to learn, kids, about following God. The first one is we need to be humble. Even though Paul was, had great reputation, he basically said, I'm the least of all the apostles. It wasn't to make people feel bad for him. It was basically he realized that God was so much higher than him, and he wanted to do the best he could for him. And he says that I am not meek to be called an apostle. He wasn't originally with the twelve. He was actually in the crowd on the other side where Jesus was calling them hypocrites and everything else. But he did see the resurrected Christ. He did have the message to go preach the gospel. He did have the, the ability to do miraculous things to show that God was in him. And he says, because he says, I persecuted the church of God. We need to not live in the past but we need to remember what God has changed us from. And this just doesn't apply to kids, it applies to all of us. We need to understand where God has brought us from. That ought to make us thankful. That ought to make us thankful. And so he says this. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. The fact that we got up this morning was by the grace of God. The fact that we had protection on the roads was by the grace of God. The fact that we had health today is by the grace of God. The fact that we are saved is by the grace of God. It's all by the grace of God. God does it. We can't. We can't. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. My prayer for you kids and my prayer for everybody that hears this is that God makes you exactly the way God wants you to be. And he saves you and he gives you his grace, and he gives you the power to be more like him. 
to follow his truth. And he said, and so the issue here, look at the next statement here. And, it, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It wasn't wasted. You know, sometimes we get a new toy or we get a new game and we play that game and then all of a sudden we put it away and we don't use it anymore. We can't do that with what God's grace is. When God's grace is given to us, we need to use it all the time. And he will give us more grace. And he says, but I labored more abundantly. He worked at it because he was thankful for what God had done in his life. And he wanted his life to show that he was thankful too. And he says, yet not I, but the what? Grace of God, which was with me. This week, kids, and Thanksgiving, thank God. Thank Jesus for saving your soul. Thank God for giving you life. Thank God for giving, letting you go to school. Thank God for your teachers. Thank God for your family. Because God's put all this for a purpose, and that's to glorify him. And let's understand that it's not us, it's all about God. So you have a great week off. We'll see you next Sunday. For us this morning, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are going to continue on the theme of being thankful. And the title of my sermon this morning is Thanksgiving, the Art of Contentment. You know, some people just have a better way of doing something than others. And we say they have a knack for it, or they have the art of doing it, or they understood the art, the art of this. But when you're talking about serving God, it's all about Christ. This church is all about Christ. The Bible is all about Christ. It's all about Him and Him alone. In Christ alone. To be contented means to know Christ, means to live in Christ, means to follow Him. So we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 12. Thanksgiving, the art of contentment. And this week, let's be thankful for God. Amen. Before we read the scripture this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for an opportunity, Lord, to open your word. Father, we ask that it's truth. Speak to us today. Father, help us to be thankful. Help us to be content. Help us to know you. Lord, help your Holy Spirit to have full reign here. Take away all distractions and bind Satan on our behalf. Father, I pray that someone here does not know you as Savior, let today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray for us that might be struggling with things in our lives. Lord, I ask that you just give us peace. Lord, I pray that we help us, Lord, to understand your grace and that you give grace abundantly today and that you change our lives. Lord, help us today, Lord. Help us to leave here different than what we came in, knowing that we met with you today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 12, Paul is closing out this first letter to Timothy, and he says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. Knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Doesn't sound like being content, does it? Not being thankful. Wherefore cometh envy, strife, railings, envy, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is guileliness, from such withdraw thyself. Yesterday I met a man. And he was critical of Christianity in general because of a noteworthy pastor who is rich in town. Folks, it's not about being wealthy. It's about knowing God. Amen. It's about understanding the riches of his grace and the riches of his glory. And this issue about wealth and prosperity after, the, after salvation... I clearly tell people who come and they ask for help and they ask for prayer. I tell them this. I don't know what's going to happen if you receive Christ. But receiving Christ is not a rubber stamp ticket to get all that you want. 
But basically what it is, it's a direction in your life that changes. It gives you eternity. And it allows you to get the peace to go through life's troubles in the good times and the bad times. There's a lot of people, and we saw in Matthew 13 in that parable, that when persecution comes, some people walk away because they have no root in themselves. Christ gives you the root that allows you to go through life's troubles. Christ gives you the root that allows you to go through victories with a humble mind, giving all praise to God. And it says here, he says, but godliness is con with contentment. Well, he says, suppose that gain is godliness from such withdrawal thyself. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Everything about God is great. And we need to understand that. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich, that's wanting to be rich. That's working to be rich. That is the focus of their life. Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men, not just hinder them, drown them. And to drown means to die. In destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some cutteth after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. See, we need to understand several things. First of all, there are two major ways of finding contentment. You could try to find contentment through yourself. And there's a lot of people that hope to gain contentment through wealth and success. There's people that hope to gain contentment through personal achievement. So people honor them and give glory to them. But there's a lot of people today that are wealthy. There's a lot of people that are successful. There's a lot of people that are honored, then they're still not content. You know, they're never satisfied. They always want more. And that's the problem. In Proverbs 30, it talks about things that always want more, that are never satisfied. Folks, if you try to please yourself by yourself, there's always something else. There's always more. There's always something lacking. And that won't work. That truly does not bring true, everlasting contentment. But the Savior does. Amen. The Savior does. Paul is writing Timothy from jail. And here, most people in jail, oh, woe is me, I'm in here unfairly. But Paul has the ability to write to his protege and basically encourage them because he had contentment where he was. And that could only come through a relationship with Christ. Last week, we talked about peace with God. And we use Romans chapter 5. And in verse 1, it says this. It says that, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness will bring contentment. Contentment always has peace. We see here in this early part of this passage that people who try to strive for themselves, strive to get stuff, basically have disputings and strive and railings, and envy, which is not contentment, because they always want more. So this morning, how do you seek contentment? Do you seek contentment through yourself, through your pursuits, or do you pursue God and holiness 
and godliness. A thankful heart is the key to contentment. It's expected by God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule. Not just be in there. Let it control you. Rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called into one body, and what? Everybody say this, and be ye thankful. We need to be thankful because that is the key to contentment. And the thankfulness doesn't come from up here. It comes from down here. But unfortunately, we can extinguish the heart, and we can extinguish thankfulness in our heart by being ungodly. In Romans chapter 1, which is an indictment against the Roman Empire at that time, and society at that time, it's a very same indictment against us today, the worldview. It says, in Romans 1, 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They said there's something else. Neither were what? Thankful. And then there's a whole long list of things that start. And it starts with not being thankful. Taking thankfulness and extinguish it in your heart, you're not going to look at God. And it says, which neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So this morning I want to share three things about how to be thankful this morning. Three things about how to be thankful and why thankful people are content. The first one is this. Thankful people rejoice in what they have. Thankful people rejoice in what they have. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness or without wanting And be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. This right here is the key to conquering covetousness. God takes this very seriously. It's the tenth commandment. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, nor thy neighbor's wife, nor thy neighbor's ox, nor thy neighbor's eye. Whatever is of your neighbor's. Christ said, love thy neighbor as thyself, and you'll fulfill the law. See, covetous people won't love other people. Covetous people are not thankful because they don't have enough. And so basically, let your conversation or your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content. That's the key. We need to be content. Contentment frees us from, for, from lusting for possession. It frees us to worship God. Christ himself said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot worship God and mammon. So the issue is, is that be content with such as you have. Paul was content because he was continually thankful. He told the church at Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, In everything, what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, he's not talking about Texas. Okay. I know how, both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. There's three things here that Paul brings out. The first one is, is that a thankful heart made him contented all the time. You know, Christ says in his model prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things be added unto you. He told his disciples, he says, your father in heaven knows what you need. 
And later on in this chapter, he says, but my God will supply all my what? Need, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So he realized here that a thankful heart was not based on what made him contented all the time, and it was not based on what he had or what he didn't have because he knew how to have a lot and he knew how to have a little. And whatever the case may be, he was still content. The problem is today, when you get more, you want more. Okay? And when you get less, you want more. So Paul realized, he says, I know how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And Christ made him content in all conditions because he says, I can do what? All things through Christ, which strengthens me. So thankful people rejoice in what they have because they live that way. They take out covetousness in their life. Paul was content because he was continually thankful, and thankful people recognize the temporary nature of all earthly things. You know, this passage basically says we took nothing in the world, we can't take anything out. We came into this world broke, and we're going to leave broke. You know, there's people that get buried in Cadillacs. You know what? They're buried in Cadillacs. In eternity, that Cadillac's not there. There were Egyptian pharaohs that got built in pyramids, and all those riches were inside of there to try to appease the gods. And you know something? All those riches were still there. And then people came in and stole them. Or they wound up in museums. See, the issue is, if we were born broke and we will die the same way, and as it says in our passage here in verses 6 and 7, it says, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. It says, for we brought nothing into this world, and certainly we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, therewith to be content. Look at Job, okay? Job, in one day, lost everything he had. He lost all of his kids. And then he loses his health. And his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? But Job came up with this statement. And it's written in the scriptures for us to learn by. In verse 21 of Job chapter 1, he says, Naked came I into out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I'll tell you what, that's a hard thing to do. Boy, we don't want anything taken away from us. You go take something away from a small child and see what happens. But you know something? As adults, we just do it in a more mature way. It says, in all this, Job, sin not, nor charge God foolishly. See, he was thankful in what God had given him, and he was thankful for what God had allowed him to have at that time. It's exactly the same as Paul. And Paul, and so we see that thankful people rejoice in what they have. Secondly, thankful people refuse to be ruled by what they don't have. Hmm. You know, David was talking about a new truck this morning in Sunday school. He would like to have it, and then saw the price tag. And then saw a used truck, saw the price tag. And I said, I'm happy with what I got. Amen. Okay? I'm happy with what they got. You know something? That is a very important thing that we un need to understand. Because here's the fact. The desire to be rich rules many people. The desire to be rich is not restricted to the world. It's also in the church. It's also in the church. See, as it says in our text, it says here in verse 9, it says, But they that will be rich or want to be rich fall into temptations and a snare. What you do is you fall into the devil's trap and into many foolish and hurtful lusts because you always want to what? You always want what? More. And then 
you get drowned. You get drowned. So we need to understand that this is not the right way. This is not leading, you know, this is not living a godly life. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 says this. It says, let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. I know people that they pray for the new truck. They pray for a new house. They pray for all this. James says you ask and you have not because you ask and miss. So you can consume it on your own lust. God says he'll supply your needs, not your wants. And then they get mad when they don't get what they want. You know, what we ought to be praying for is what God wants. Amen. What God wants in our life. What God wants in the lives of others. What God wants in our church. What God wants in our country. Take your mind off of you. Not let every man think on his own things, but on things of others in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot t be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You make the decision on where you're going to put the priority in your life. It says, and then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. We see in Timothy it says that they go off to many other lusts, and then they drown themselves in, de in destruction and perdition. And James adds this one thing. He says, do not err, my beloved brother. So if you're here today seeking God for what he can give you beyond spiritual things, you're asking amiss. You need to be asking for salvation because that's part of God's will. You need to be asking to be thankful that that's part of God's will. You need to be asking to be conformed to his image because that's God's will. You ought to be asking for the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word of God to you because that's in God's will. You ought to be asking for the ability to go out and preach the word and share the word. That's God's will. And then God will give you everything else that you need. See, the desire to be rich rules many people today, but it shouldn't rule the Christian's heart. It goes on in verse 10 that the love of money is the root of all evil. And there are some politicians that say that money is the root of all evil. That's not the case. It's being consumed by it. It's by wanting it all the time. And I will tell you this, that bondage to the love of money costs people their souls. It cost the rich young ruler his soul. In Luke chapter 18, we talked about this last week. Rich young ruler comes to Christ and says, Good master, what good thing can I do to receive heaven? And he says, You know the commandments? He says, Yeah, I've kept all these commandments from my youth up. And then Christ says, But one thing you lack, sell all that you have and give to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. And in verse 23 and 24 of Luke chapter 18, we see that he did it, right? No. It says, and when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He couldn't let go of that. He was in bondage to it. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? That passage before James chapter 1 verse 13 talks about the rich that the rich need to be made humble and that you shouldn't seek to be rich so God's got a big part of this and then the disciples said well who can get saved he said God these things are with man these things are not possible with God all things are what possible Amen. so the love of money is the root of all evil and bondage to the love of money cost the rich man his soul. But you know something, breaking free from the love of money brought salvation for Zacchaeus. And we know the story of Zacchaeus. In the very next chapter in Luke, Christ is walking down the road. There's a great crowd. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he? He climbed up in the what? The sycamore tree to see Jesus. 
And Jesus looked up and saw him and said, I want to eat lunch with you today. And all the religious people said, ah, you can't do that. He's a tax collector. Christ meets you where you are, and God will change you if you give up what you're loving right now and love God. And love God. And so, when Jesus is in the house, things change. In Luke chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, it says, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Could you be like Zacchaeus today? Could you give up half? In Acts chapter 2, in the early church, the early church gave up their possessions and distributed those who had need. Can we do it today? Or we say, we'll pray with you. James says, if you see someone has need and you say, pray, be warm and be filled and you don't do anything, what good is it? What good is your faith? He says, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Oh, that means reconciling? That means admitting you were wrong? That means that you could make restit restitution? Yep. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. So the desire to be rich rules many people. And it rules many people today. I had a co-worker when I worked out at Lackland. All he did in the morning, he went up and told me how his 401k did. He had times more than what I had. And he came to me and he said, well, you got to invest. you got to invest. And he kept on saying, oh, how much do you have? And I said, enough. And folks, that's what we need to live by, enough. Because if we have more, we'll depend on the more instead of depending on God. Chasing dreams of money and possessions is costly. It's costly. It's wasted effort. It's wasted effort. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5, it says, Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Well, I know something better than you. No. You need to let God tell you what you know. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches, what? Certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle towards heaven, and the government will get all of it. But it's, that's not the point. We hear about all the things that make things go away. But why don't we not hear about God? and about giving us eternal life, and about what the real treasures are. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, the Bible says this, it says, it says, let not, lay out up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You know, you have a good place, you have big gates, you have security guards, you're trying to protect that. It says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and your thieves do not break through or steal. You know what happens if you get rich? You spend all your time staying rich and trying to keep what you got. But the Christian life is about surrender and giving up things that, that you've got for him. It's also wasted eternity. Wasted eternity. It says, 
For what is a man advantaged? If he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away. Yesterday I was talking to a young man and he says, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And he says, I just, I just can't get control of this. And I said, because you don't want to deny yourself. I say, you don't say no. Okay? What did Christ say? If anyone want to follow me? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Deny himself, tell him you're saying no. When you feel that urge to go get something, no. You get that urge to follow God, that's what you need to do. So thankful people refuse to be ruled by what they don't have. We want to use our efforts to the right thing. Lastly, thankful people recognize God gives us all that we have. He says that godliness and contentment, with contentment is great gain. The reality of it is, is that godliness and contentment go together. You can't be godly and be greedy. Cash without Christ caters only to carnality. Possessions without the Prince of Peace will never satisfy. You will always want more. The word for contentment is also translated sufficiency. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having, that ye always having all sufficiently. That it's white for one reason, because it's the same word that's translated contentment. And it basically says, having what you need to do what you need to do. That's basically it. Having what you need to do what you need to do. Okay? And then, if you have what you need to do what you need to do, you may abound to what? Every good work. That's what godliness from contentment will bring. You have all that you need to do what you need to do, and you'll abound in that. Contentment comes from knowing and serving Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Folks, Christ didn't save us because of our bank account. Christ didn't save us because of our last name. Christ didn't save us because of the color of our skin. Christ saved us because he loved us. And he realized that without him, we would go to hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Oh, by the way, he owns everything because he created everything. Amen. So what right do you have to say, this is mine? No, it's his. He's just allowing you to use it. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You know, when you leave this world, you need the salvation of Christ. You're not taking the stuff that you have down here with you. And only if you have Christ will you have an eternity in heaven. And all the stuff that we leave will be left behind. Do you know Jesus Christ today? Or are you serving him? If you're serving him, you need to be content. Everything we have is from our loving Savior's hand. In James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no fairness, neither shadow of turning. Well, I got that promotion. No, promotion comes from the Lord. 
I got this great house. No, God allowed you to have that house. God allowed me to do all these things because God did it. That's how you can be content when it's not about you and it's all about him. The question this morning is, are you a contented Christian? Are you a contented Christian? Do others recognize the reason for your peace? Do you have that peace? It should be made manifest in our lives. In Psalm 100, verses 3 through 5, and I will close with this. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that made us and made everything that we do. And not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His thanks, gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Folks, that should make us content in itself. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. Lord, I just ask you this time of invitation. Father, if someone here does not know you as Savior, if they don't know where they would spend eternity, Father, I pray that they would recognize that you sent your to live a perfect life, to die on a sinner's place on the cross, which represents us. He paid the ultimate price for sin, which was death. He was buried for three days and rose again on the third day to show he has power over death and now and power over sin and sits at the right hand of you, offering salvation and forgiveness of sins to all who ask. Lord, I pray if someone here today does not know you, that they would call out to you and ask for forgiveness of their sins and ask you to save them. Lord, I pray for us that if we're not content because of stuff that we don't have, Father, take that desire away. Lord, help us be content with what we do have. And Father, help us all to understand that everything that we do have comes from you, and that we could be thankful and humble and content. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have thine own way. be content with what God has given us. Amen. And thank you daily for that. God bless you all. You're dismissed.